Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details. Thank you for downloading and listening to This Pathological Life. If you're interested in continuing the story, we have a second series called This Medical Life. Please download it and subscribe now. Dr. Travis Brown, why do we need a podcast called This Pathological Life? Every disease has its own story to tell. So we're going to tell them. In this episode of This Pathological Life, we're looking at Epstein-Barr virus. And we're doing that with Dr. David Ellis, anatomical pathologist at ClinPath. David, welcome to the show. Thanks, Steve. Your anatomical pathology, but this is EBV, a virus. How is it that you have an interest in, in EBV? Exactly. Well, firstly, I'm not a virologist and I'm not a molecular biologist or pathologist. My interest is lymphoma. Through all of my professional life, EBV has been circling because it's involved in a number of lymphomas and it's always been a bit of a mystery. So in 2011, I was asked to give the uh, McGovern Memorial Lecture at the International Academy of Pathology and I decided to pick on EBV as an opportunity to finally sort out in my mind what it's doing in all of us. And that's really the story of this talk. And I'll mention that with this talk that's about to commence, uh, there is a presentation that goes with it. And if the technology gods are on our side, there'll be a link in the show notes to the audiovisual version of what you're about to hear so you can watch the slides as well as listen to David. This is as much about people and serendipity as it is about science. And I'm going to start with Dennis Parsons Burkett who's an Irishman who was born in 1911 in Northern Ireland. Um, He was the son of an ornithologist, which is significant. His father, James Burkett, is credited as being probably the first person to band birds and study their migration patterns on a geographic basis. And now you might think that's irrelevant, but you'll see later that it's actually fundamental to this story. So Dennis... uh, Burkett did engineering at his father's instigation, but wasn't a great success. And ultimately, he uh, decided to change course and do medicine. And at university, he was actually part of a Bible group. He was uh, very religious, and one of his heroes was Livingston. And that's also an important component of the story. So at the end of doing his medicine... He wanted to become a surgeon, but unfortunately he was one-eyed. Due to a childhood accident, he'd lost the use of one of his eyes. So we have a one-eyed Irish surgeon with a father as an ornithologist who is looking for a job as a surgeon immediately post-war. So during the war, of course, he was engaged all around the world in the British Empire, serving After that, he tried to get a job as a surgeon, but nobody seemed to want a one-eyed surgeon. Eventually, he joined the British Colonial Service, and and partly because of his religious views and worship of uh, Livingston, he went to Africa, to Uganda, and worked in the Malago Hospital and the Makareri Medical School as a surgeon. Shortly after arriving there, he was introduced to a patient, a child of, I think, about four or five, with a very large tumour growing out of his jaw, which caused gross disfigurement of the child and was like something we would never have seen in Western medicine, which obviously impressed Burkett. But more significantly, he saw another similar case within a matter of weeks and began to think there's something going on here which is unusual. And although a lot of his colleagues at the college, at the Malago Hospital, thought that he was perhaps making a bit of a beat up he persisted in pursuing this thing and over a period of the next 10 years accumulated over 120 cases of this bizarre tumour which no one had seen in the western world so this is where some of his uh, upbringing came came into play the first thing he did was he thought well what's the distribution of this tumour so he sent out pamphlets to all the hospitals and centres around Africa that he knew of, 
with pictures and sketches of this tumour, asking if anyone had seen anything like it. And he had answers back showing that it, other examples were seen throughout equatorial Africa. And so he thought, this is, this is worth pursuing. So eventually he had enough cases and he published a report of this tumour in The Lancet, which um, he thought must have been some form of sarcoma or tumour of soft tissues. Um, it turns out that he wasn't the first person to describe this tumour because there'd been a previous missionary called Albert Ruskin Cook who in 1890s took a party of 50 people, including his future wife, to, to set up the Malago Hospital in Uganda and on his way, incidentally, camped on the open plains of what was to become Nairobi. <laughs> uh, and it turned out that in the examination of Albert Ruskin Cook's notes from the 1890s, there was a sketch of exactly this tumour. And that still exists to this day. And on the sketch, Ruskin's note said, the growth appears to be nearly half the size of the child's head, fixed to the underside of the jaw. The child was carefully fed and cleaned up for a week. And on May the 21st operation, child died on the table soon after the operation had commenced. So you can imagine what it would be like trying to operate on something that's replaced half this child's head in an operating theatre that was essentially a straw hut with none of the facilities when you consider that even today no one would attempt to deal with this surgically. So what did Burkitt do next? Well, remember his father's ornithological bird banding and the geographic nature of that. I think this may have influenced Burkitt because he then set about looking for the geographic distribution of this tumour in Africa and he went on a safari. And in the process of doing this, he got together with two similarly religious uh, colleagues, Ted Williams and Cliff Nelson. And they went on a 1,600 mile, 16,000 mile trip, looking for evidence of the disease to try and determine where it, where it existed in Africa. And it, this is probably one of the pioneering epi epidemiological field surveys ever performed. So you would think that the Imperial Cancer Research Fund might have fitted him out with a Series 1 Land Rover and they would go off and, and look for it. But no, they were much more enterprising than that. And Burkitt was fairly parsimonious. They bought a second-hand Ford and uh, I think Cliff Nelson or Ted Williams then welded on a sump guard underneath to protect it as they, rock, as they rolled and rocked over all the unmade roads. And they travelled down the whole of the east coast of Africa down to South Africa looking for evidence of this tumour through Mozambique, Nyasaland, Rhodesia, Swaziland, Tanganyika. And whenever the, whenever the car boiled, which it did occasionally, they'd get out, get out their chairs and make a cup of tea, as you would. <laughs> An extraordinary thing happened when they got to Portuguese Mozambique because they'd already had an indication that it hadn't been seen in that site. But they met a Dr Prates. And he'd been in the habit of making plaster casts of unusual tumours that he'd seen. He went into a warehouse and pulled out six examples, immaculate examples, of the upper half of patients with exactly this tumour, with large masses growing out of the side of their, of their heads. And probably these still exist somewhere in, in that part of the world today. They followed up this safari with other safaris into the west of Africa and Burkitt then published that eventually in I think 1962 or 63 where he identified the limitations of this disease in Africa and what he was able to show was that in the equatorial band which is obviously around the equator the disease, the disease was seen everywhere except over 5,000 feet. Further south on the Federation Band, which goes through Rhodesia and Nyasaland, it was seen only in the valleys below 3,000 feet. 
and down south in South Africa it was seen only on the coastal plain below 1,000 feet and north of Natal. So clearly it was, it was limited by altitude and latitude. In other words, the temperature had to be more than 64 degrees. It was also limited by aridity, and that is it needed rainfall of greater than 22 inches per annum. So this clearly indicated, and as he quoted, the possibility that this tumour is vector transmitted and may therefore be virus induced. And the observations he recorded provided support for that. The only exception to this, these rules were that uh, Zanzibar and Kinhasa uh, fulfilled these criteria but had no examples. And it's of interest that they were the two places where malaria and mosquitoes had been eliminated. So clearly we have very good circumstantial evidence that this is uh, passed on with, uh, with mosquitoes as the vector and probably an underlying virus. Before he published this, he went on a tour back to England, and his first lecture tour, he was at the Middlesex Hospital in 1961, and a sign went up on the notice board outside saying, a combined medical and surgical staff meeting will be held on Wednesday the 22nd of March 1961 at 5.15 in the Courtauld Lecture Theatre. A Mr D.P. Burkett from Makarira College, Uganda, will talk on the commonest children's cancer in tropical Africa, a hitherto unrecognised syndrome. Now, it just so happened that working in the Bland Sutton Institute at that time was one Anthony Epstein, who was an early adoptee of electron microscopy, who'd recently spent time in, a, in New York with a future Nobel Prize winning electron microscopist. And at the time, Anthony Epstein had been working on the chicken roux sarcoma virus and its possible cause of cancer in chickens. But as he sat in this lecture theatre listening to deep to Dennis Burkett, the light bulb moment occurred. And even while Dennis Burkett was still talking, he decided to abandon his research and pursue this. His whole life changed on this moment. And he spoke to Dennis Burkett and arranged to have samples of the tumour flown from Uganda to England every Friday. So sure was he that this was a pivotal moment in his and everyone else's life that he took the sign off the notice board and kept it forever. <laughs> and it still exists. So for the next two years, Anthony Epstein pursued this process, convinced that there must be a virus behind the, behind the disease. But he couldn't find the virus. So the first thing to do was to examine tumour tissue and look for the virus down the electron microscope. It was unsuccessful. He then realised he had to try and culture the virus. Again, he was unsuccessful. He was lucky enough to get a, a grant of, I think, $40,000 from the NIH in America. And using that money, he then employed a virologist, an Irish virologist called Yvonne Barr, who joined the team along with Bert Achong, who was a pathologist born in Trinidad and Tobago in the port of Spain, who had mastered the art of electron microscopy and was able to help with the electron micro microscopic side of things. So every Friday, a green thermos flask would appear and they would seek to try and grow or see viruses in it using the electron microscope. And as Anthony Epstein points out, in those days, people didn't even accept that you could find viruses using the electron microscope. They thought it was an artefact. So it was fairly radical uh, science at the time. Despite all these favors, failures for two years, on one occasion, the thermos flask was put in the comet and sent off to, to London, but it encountered storms on the way and was diverted to Manchester. And in the process of being thrown around in the air and delayed, when Anthony Epstein went up to Manchester on Friday, Friday night, thinking he actually should be starting his weekend, he picked up the thermos and it was cloudy. And he thought it must have been contaminated with bacteria on, due to the delay. So he thought it was probably a waste of time. But it turned out that the reason it was cloudy wasn't because 
it was bacterially contaminated, but because it had turned into a suspension of free cells. And as we now know, if you want to culture lymphocytes, you have to create a suspension. So by sheer serendipity, a successful suspension of uh, lymphocytes was produced. These, these were then grown out by uh, Yvonne. And in 1964, he looked down the microscope and for the first time saw the virus, which he recognised as being some sort of human herpes virus, but slightly smaller than the, than the herpes simplex virus, which we're familiar with. So for the first time, we actually had recognised the virus, and that was published as a rapid communication in The Lancet. Not long after that, Dennis Wright and others in Uganda actually used electron microscopy to demonstrate the virus in the tumour itself. Now, the problem was we had good evidence that the virus was in the tumour and seemed to be involved in the, in the production of the tumour, but it was expected in those days that you actually had to demonstrate a biological effect of the, of the virus to prove that it was causal. So Anthony Epstein teamed up with a, a married couple who worked in the Children's Hospital in Pennsylvania who had al already worked on adenovirus, etc., and had an international rep uh, reputation. And Gertrude Henley was married to Werner Henley, and Gertrude then took on the task of investigating this virus, having been sent cultures by Yvonne and, and uh, Anthony. In the course of tissue culture experiments with samples from this, they found that human lymphocytes, which had been inoculated with Epstein-Barr virus in culture, grew in a semi-malignant fashion in vitro and showed fine structural features suggestive of malignancy and when examined in the electron microscope were seen to carry a virus. So already there was clearly some transforming effect of this virus in normal human lymphocytes which was poorly understood. So Gertrude Henley, Tony Epstein, Bertrand Chong and Yvonne Barr wrote up their studies. What they were able to show is that during the course of infection of of normal lymphocytes with the virus, a series of antigens were produced, and these include immediate early antigen, early early antigen, viral capsid antigen, nuclear antigens or EBNAs, latent membrane proteins or LMPs, and heterophile antibodies to a range of different um, antigens. They also were able to generate immunity to these antigens in human subjects by, rec by identifying antibodies. And to their astonishment, in the course of doing this, they discovered that although this disease was discovered in darkest Africa in a rare tumour, the antibodies to this virus were present in over 90% of adult Americans. So clearly, this is a most unusual virus and the questions that immediately arose were what is it that's different in Africa that caused tumours but not in Americans and more importantly what is it, what disease is caused in America and the rest of the world by the same virus. The answer to the second question came through another lucky break. Gertrude and Werner Henley, being German of course, were fairly tough on their staff. One of the lab assistants who worked there was Elaine Hutkin, a young adolescent girl, and one day she reported sick and said she couldn't come in. So Werner said, no, I think she should come in. <laughs> you know, we don't stop for sickness. But they had a young postdoc there called Volker Deal. We'll hear more of him later. Also from Germany. He had a hunch and he knew that Elaine Hutkin had recently had a boyfriend, first boyfriend. He went out to see her at home and took blood and brought it back. And they found that Elaine, who'd previously not had antibodies to Epstein-Barr virus, and in fact they'd used her lymphocytes in some of the tests, had converted to being positive with antibodies to Epstein-Barr virus. So the circumstantial evidence was that this was causing her disease. 
And when she returned, she had a rash and she'd been given ampicillin and she had all the features of infectious mononucleosis. And so it became apparent that the disease which this virus was causing in Western communities was infectious mononucleosis. And of course they published this. So the early ser serological studies up until the late 60s showed that it caused infectious mononucleosis, first shown by the Henleys and Volker Deal, but subsequent prospective studies at Yale University confirmed that. It was clearly associated with Burkitt lymphoma and seemed to be necessary for the development of it, and yet it wasn't sufficient because people in America weren't getting Burkitt lymphoma like they were seeing in Africa. Following this, the WHO sponsored a West Nile study where 42,000 serological samples were taken from local people and examined for EBV antibodies and Volker Deal actually took part in that and took many of the early samples. Out of those 42,000 serological samples, 16 people developed Burkitt lymphoma and were found to have much higher antibody teeters against EBV. In 1971, Levine and Cosberard identified high EBV teeters in a subset of patients with Hodgkin's disease and it became apparent that certain types of Hodgkin's disease in a reasonable percentage of cases actually had in high teeters to Epstein-Barr virus and in 1989 a prospective study showed that this preceded Hodgkin's disease by several years. And more recently we've been able to show similarly in tissue sections that a large or a significant percentage of Hodgkin lymphoma actually contain EB virus and that the virus is clonal itself, indicating that it was present in the, in the patient at the time of transformation. So it's clearly involved in the production of Hodgkin lymphoma in a significant percentage of cases. Also in the 1970s, patients with nasopharyngeal carcinoma, particularly common in Asians, were found to have high antibody teeters to EBV. And so at this stage in the early to mid 70s, it was clear that EBV not only caused Burkitt lymphoma or was strongly involved in Burkitt lymphoma and causes infectious mononucleosis, it also was involved in Hodgkin lymphoma and nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Subsequently, that list of diseases has expanded to over 20 or more with some quite rare um, lymphomas which we have to deal with on a daily basis. Um, and also post-transplantation immunodeficiency states and immunodeficiency states due to drugs and also other infections where the damage to the patient's immunity enables the Epstein-Barr virus to, to uh, undergo reactivation and cause disease. And it's also associated with gastric, some forms of gastric adenocarcinoma, some pseudotumours of the liver and spleen, some smooth muscle tumours, and increasingly it's been suggested that it may be involved in some autoimmune diseases, and that particular example it would be uh, multiple sclerosis, where people for many years have been seeking evidence that it's involved in that. So to understand the virus, I think we need to go back to some basic biology and look at how it, how it does what it does. So the EBV is a double-stranded DNA virus which particularly, which involves vertebrates and in particular the human. It has, um, based on EBNA2 sequences, there are two different strains. Strain EBV version uh, two is more common in Africa, but uh, there's no known importance of which strain you have with regards to malignancy, and many people are co-infected with both types. This virus, in the, in the light of current discussion about COVID and zoonoses and the crossing over of viruses into the human host as an unusual event and the damage that it can cause, EB virus 
is quite different in that it's evolved over tens of million years, at least 40 million years it's evolved with human beings. So it's related to the lymphocryptoviruses of old world primates. And old world primates diverged from new and old world primates about 40 million years ago. So the specific features of Epstein-Barr virus have been constrained by their evolutionary development co-evolving with us. And if you think about it, this is a remarkably successful move since most of the old world primates are gone and many of the new world primates are gone and the human race, which is now near 8 billion people, where 90% at least of adults are infected and in poorer countries most of the, most of the children are infected most of us carry multiple copies of the virus and the virus doesn't kill. It, it lives as a true parasite in, co in a collaboration with human beings. If you ask me, does it do any good for us? Are there any positive effects? There may be, but I'm not aware of them. But it is probably one of the most successful parasites in history, certainly as far as we're concerned. It belongs to the human herpes virus family. And the significance of that is that herpes viruses have a similar structure and they all have the ability to establish a latent infection by evading the host immune response. And that's critical to the, to the way it behaves. So other members of this same family include herpes simplex virus one and two, which as you know are responsible for oral ulcers, etc., and genital herpes. Varicella zoster, Epstein-Barr virus is human herpes 4, cytomegalovirus is human herpes 5, and human herpes virus 6 and 7 are 6 disease, and human herpes virus 8 is responsible for Kaposi's sarcoma. All of these viruses initially become involved in human infection and cause lytic infection where there's damage to the cells until such time as people develop sufficient immunity to cause the virus to, to go into a latent state where it hides in certain parts of the body and in individual cells and remains there as long as the immune system forces it to do so. So the lytic cycle, which is what happens with initial infection, involves active viral replication using viral machinery to produce active virions which can exist outside the body and infect other people. And in general they're called lytic because the cells that hold the virus undergo lysis and die as a result, which is one of the reasons why people become sick. However, once you become immune, the virus is no longer able to survive as a free agent. And so what it does is it becomes locked into the cell in the nucleus and replicates thereafter only when the host cell replicates using host machinery as a true parasite and it reduces expression of antigens on the cell surface almost completely so that the immune system can't recognise it. So effectively it gives no signals to the immune system that it's there but it is there and every time that host cell multiplies, the virus multiplies with it using the host, the host cellular machinery. So the host immunity forces the virus to go into a latent state. A number of things will cause it to go back into a lytic state. One of these is if the host cell is about to undergo apoptosis. The virus, in a sense, seems to be able to recognise that it's about to lose its cosy existence and immediately sets out the rescue um, if you like the rescue ships and goes into a lytic phase and starts trying to create active virions to escape while it still can so that once you've been infected by EBV there's a permanent change in those cell lines which are anti, anti cell death so let's look briefly at primary infection probably the most important thing to recognise that in underdeveloped countries and particularly in Africa the mothers introduce the virus to the children at three years or less. So it, in, in Africa it's a disease of young children and infants probably through, viral, through uh, salivary spread whereas in the West 
It's a disease of teens and young adults and causes infectious mononucleosis. And whereas in our society, people who get infectious mononucleosis become sick, in Africa it's asymptomatic, occurring in children. So the root is generally saliva. It can be sexual or transplacental, but that's uncommon. Various immune processes act against the virus. The first one is innate immunity, using natural killer cells, which certainly have a role in the initial adapt uh, before adaptive immune response develops. And the magnitude of the NK response may determine whether the primary infection has a clinical outcome. But adaptive immunity is critical and there's a rapid appearance of antibodies to lytic antigens such as viral capsid antigen, early antigen and membrane antigen. And initially it's IgM and then switches to IgG as in all infections. And later the serological response to the nuclear proteins, the EBNAs. So the lytic cycle is shut down after maybe two weeks. And there are a number of latency states which are defined by the expression of all these different viral antigens. And most people, once they've got over the disease, are type naught or carrier, which means they all express EBA transcripts, the RNAs, in small numbers. And some will express the nuclear antigen EBNA1, and some won't. Expression of other things, such as EBNA2, EBNA3, LMP1 or LMP2, indicate an abnormal latency which is associated with various tumours. 8% of the EBV genome is lost with each cycle, so it should die out in theory in any given host, even though it's latent. The other thing that happens is that as they process through the body, remember these are memory B cells that are recirculating, as they, as they reach the oropharynx and particularly the tonsil, some of them undergo plasmacytic differentiation, which is a trigger for the lytic cycle. Somehow they enter the epithelial cells and form rafts of epithelial cells in the tonsil and within, the, within those rafts of epithelial cells EBV is invisible to the immune system and is free to replicate in a lytic cycle, which it does. And at the end of the lytic cycle the cells lies and the, and the free virions are released into the oropharynx, into the saliva which is the source of the shedding in normal people. The dynamics of EBV shedding are quite interesting. It used to be thought that people are either shedders or they're not. But more work has shown that actually most people are shedders, but cyclically, as the immune system goes through cycles of activity. So every time you get in contact with people around you and share saliva, there's a very good chance there'll be EB virions involved one way or the other. So these rafts of um, epithelial cells shedding active virions not only spread via the saliva to other people, but also enable reinfection of the host if the antibodies in the saliva aren't strong enough to kill off the virus. And there's one particular example where this is particularly noticeable, and that was in HIV, where oral hairy leukoplakia, a feature of AIDS, is actually nothing more than an exaggerated oral plaque of EBV lytically infected oral mucosa generating active virions. So everyone I think is well aware of all the features of infectious mononucleosis of primary infection, fever, hepatosplenomegaly, lymphadenopathy, pharyngitis, the abnormal lymphocyte morphology, the heterophile antibodies, the rash to ampicillin, and it seems more likely in given recent studies that EBV infection, particularly infectious mononucleosis, permanently alters the immune system, as many viruses do, and as we suspect COVID is doing today. Severe complications of the infection obviously include airways obstruction, haemophagocytic syndrome, which is a cytokine storm, severe hepatosplenomegaly, coagulopathy, and CNS and vascular dysfunction. Some people have referred to infectious mononucleus a mononucleosis as a spontaneously resolving leukaemia. And that's effectively what it would be if it wasn't for our immune system. It would lead to replication beyond to the patient's death. A Probably one of the most cited articles in biological literature is called The Hallmarks of Cancer, 
written by Hanahan and Weinberg, and they've recently updated this, and they identified the key features necessary to, in, to enable carcinogenesis. And of these, Epstein-Var virus satisfies most. That is, the ability to uh, enhance proliferation within the cells, to inhibit cell death, to evade growth suppression, and to evade senescence. All of these are features of Epstein-Barr virus. So it's not surprising that it's involved in a number of cancers. And if you look at the spectrum of human disease associated with Epstein-Barr virus, it's really a cradle to grave. Those people who are born with a genetic primary immunodeficiency are set up to be unable to deal with the primary infection and undergo prolonged lymphoproliferative disease and often lymphoma and death. People at the other end of life who develop age-related acquired immunodeficiency due to senescence are, in, are at risk of developing other lymphomas and various diseases and lymphoproliferative processes simply due to decay of their immune system that inevitably occurs in all of us with advancing age. People who have infections that cause immunodeficiency or who are given drug-related immunodeficiencies due to transplant are also at risk of lymphoproliferative disease. And, there, and then there are inherently normal immunological people, this is what we assume them to be, who are at risk of getting Epstein-Barr virus infection that may lead rarely to Burkitt lymphoma, Hodgkin's lymphoma, or in particularly in Asian people, NK T cell lymphomas. So I don't intend to spend any time talking about those other lymphomas, but I think what we should do is return to Epstein-Barr virus as a, as a cause of Burkitt lymphoma, where we started. We recognised from the Henleys way back in the 60s that if you infect normal human lymphocytes with Epstein-Barr virus, they behave as if they're a cancer. They go into uncontrolled replication resembling a tumour, but they're not actually malignant. That is, they have normal cytogenetics, they're just getting a constant growth stimulation from the virus, which is enough to make them grow out of control. But early on, uh, once cytogenetics took off, it became possible to study Burkitt lymphoma cytogenetically and it became obvious by 1974 that Burkitt lymphoma had the additional feature of cytogenetic abnormality, that is a translocation of one part of the D human DNA from one part, from one chromosome to another. And as we now know, in Burkitt lymphoma there's a translocation of the growth promoting c mic oncogene from chromosome 8 to one of the heavy chain genes on chromosome 14 or to one of the light chain genes. So what's happening in Burkitt lymphoma is more than just EBV stimulation. There's a genetic um, translocation which, mean, which clearly indicates um, a neoplasm and is the cause of the tumour. But the question remains, what is it about African children that makes them get Burkitt lymphoma, which doesn't occur in Western people? Well, we know that with Burkitt lymphoma, the site of translocation depends on, where, on, on the type of Burkitt lymphoma. We know that endemic Burkitt lymphoma, which is the one we described, occurs in Africa, which is where it's endemic. A similar sort of lymphoma does occur in Western countries, but doesn't involve the jaws and is more inclined to occur in the abdomen and is quite rare. Endemic Burkitt lymphoma occurs in the, in the VDJ region, the translocation. In sporadic lymphoma, Burkitt lymphoma that we see in our country, it occurs in the class switch region, indicating that there's a different cytogenetic abnormality and also probably a different pathogenesis. A fail-safe mechanism protects us. But clearly in Burkitt lymphoma, as we know, this isn't going to work as well because apoptosis is seriously inhibited by previous infection. 
But there must be other factors. And people looked at various dietary factors in Africa, particularly a particular plant which mothers often chew and convey to their children via saliva and therefore it was thought that maybe that explains why it occurs in the jaws. That turns out not to be true. We need to return to malaria because remember Burkitt showed that this is clearly related to malaria. There was very good, rec- good evidence for that. What is it about malaria and Epstein-Barr virus that leads to this lymphoma? Well, we now know that Plasmodium falciparum produces profound polyclonal B-cell activation and hypergammaglobulinemia, a massive stimulation of the B-cells, some or many of which will be harbouring latent infection of Epstein-Barr virus. The malaria plasmodium also causes significant reduction of CD8 cytotoxicity to Epstein-Barr virus. And as a result, the Epstein-Barr virus load increases dramatically and becomes reactivated dramatically in response to malarial infection. So the attractive hypothesis for what's going on in Burkitt lymphoma in Africa is that malaria drives a polyclonal B-cell proliferation, a massive proliferation of germinal centre activity and AID levels with an increased risk, intrinsic risk, of translocation from eight from the MYC gene on, trans- on chromosome 8 to 14, at the same time as the EB viral load is dramatically expanded by the plasmodium, the malarial parasite. Latently infected memory B cells stimulated by parts of the malarial parasite and recruited into the germinal centre then express LMP1 and 2 and EBNA1. The translocation occurs as it's wont to do and drives her- very high MYC levels which lock the cell into proliferation and would normally initiate apoptosis, but this is then inhibited by the effects of the virus and a fine balance ensues between proliferation and apoptosis. So although it was initially thought by Epstein that he was finding a virus that causes cancer, it's certainly necessary, but not sufficient. And it requires a cofactor, in this case, the plasmodium parasite. So I'm going to finish at that point and just revisit some of our heroes and see what happened to them. So Albert Ruskin Cook, our hero missionary, returned to London and became a celebrated post-missionary and um, became famous for what he'd done in, um, in Africa. Tony Epstein became Sir Anthony Epstein, FRS, CBE, and as well as being a member of the fellow, a fellow of the Royal Society, he's now 99 and a celebrated member of the medical community. Bert Achong, he went on to become a uh, pathologist in Bristol, where he became a, an inspiring tutor and lecturer for pathology trainees. And his final discovery was something called the Fomi virus. And finally, Yvonne Barr, Yvonne Barr, within 18 months of discovering the virus, met an Australian called Stuart Balding, whom she married, and they moved to Melbourne, where she then finished the the next 40 years teaching science in secondary schools. And when I gave this lecture in Melbourne in 2000, sorry, in Sydney in 2011, I asked the audience of some hundred people if anyone knew where she was, because I felt it was important, while she was still alive, that our college should recognise her achievement, because she wasn't a mere technician, she was a virologist who cultured the viruses and enabled the whole thing. And unfortunately nobody could tell me where she was, but in 2014, a a conference in Brisbane uh, was uh, looking at recent evidence on Epstein-Barr virus and someone managed to track her down. Last one, Volker Deal. Volker Deal went on to do the WHO West Nile study. He was the first person to actually culture a Hodgkin cell line, and a lot of people said only a German could do it because nobody had succeeded. And he just persisted and persisted, and he eventually produced the L428 Hodgkin cell line, which was the source of Harold Stein's anti CD30 antibodies, which, have, which we use on a daily basis. <laughs>
He founded the German Hodgkin Lymphoma Study Group with Harold Stein and led the future development of chemotherapy for Hodgkin lymphoma. So what about Dennis Burkett? Well, he joined the Cancer Research Fund in London where he had an office with a map of Africa on the wall and his pursuit from then on was fibre in the diet. He was one of the early advocates of fibre in the human diet and part of this was his observation of the African stool which was firm and large and he would travel the world lecturing on the importance of fibre in the diet and wrote a number of seminal articles and he wasn't afraid to go to American conferences and say things like America is a constipated nation if you make small stools you need big hospitals and that leaves us with EBV the first known viral cause of human cancer the first polymicrobial cancer and the first fully cloned human virus which lives in us all in perfect harmony. This Pathological Life is produced by ClinPath Pathology in South Australia. Episode notes, references and learning objectives when applicable can be found at thispathologicallife.com.au and you can contact the hosts on Twitter via at Dr. Travis Brown or at Steve Davis. Thanks again for listening, and just a reminder, if you haven't done it yet, have a quick search in your podcast app for our second series, This Medical Life. Dr. Travis Brown has rolled up some extra guests, some extra topics, and we continue the story there, and we'd love to have you along. Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details.